Welcome to Decode, I'm Kellen Mace. This is the first of two videos in this series on working with Gutenberg blocks in headless WordPress applications. Uh, this video will focus on one approach, and that is rendering Gutenberg blocks to the page as HTML. And then uh, the next video after this one will focus on an alternate approach using the WP GraphQL Gutenberg extension. So be sure to watch both to see what the differences are there and which one of those would be right for your project. Gutenberg is of course one of the key features driving WordPress forward and keeping it competitive in the CMS space. Rendering Gutenberg content in a headless environment isn't without its share of challenges though. I highly recommend reading Jason Ball's excellent Gutenberg and Decoupled Applications blog post that he wrote on the WP GraphQL blog uh, to understand um, what those challenges are and also what some of the pros and cons are for the approaches for um, working with Gutenberg in a headless environment. As Jason explains in that post, there is not currently a complete server-side registry of Gutenberg blocks. WordPress core provides a block.json file that contains some of the data about the core Gutenberg blocks, uh, but it's really not the whole picture. Um, and because of that, it's not currently possible to uh, get all the data um, that blocks have and then expose that in either the REST API or the WP GraphQL schema. So what that means for headless WordPress apps then is that as of the data that's recording, it's not possible to fire off a network request to your WordPress backend to get all of the individual blocks that exist uh, for a given post. So where does that leave us? What options do we have? Uh, for the rest of this video, we'll explore one viable option, and that is rendering Gutenberg blocks as HTML. Here, I'm running a local WordPress install, and you can see that I have the WP GraphQL plugin installed and activated. I'll head over here to GraphQL and then GraphQL IDE. You can see here that I've composed a query to get post 45 and get the title and content for that post. So I'll fire that off. So you can see that I get the title here as well as the content. And this is the fully rendered HTML here. So what's happened is WordPress has um, fetched the raw content from the database and then applied several filters to it to arrive at this final HTML at the end of the day that's meant to be displayed to the user. So you'll get um, all of the markup in here uh, for all of the Gutenberg blocks, as well as uh, classes that, that get applied and ultimately are used for styling and so on. You get all of it in this um, block of content here. So the most straightforward way to uh, get this rendered in a um, front end JavaScript app is just to take this blob of markup and render it uh, directly to the page. So let's see how we can do that next. Um, if you want to follow along, you can uh, clone down this repo here, Gutenberg demo blocks as HTML uh, from my GitHub. Um, I'll provide a link to that in the video description. Um, so that looks like uh, this. So here's the blog um, page for that uh, Next.js application that we'll be using. And you can see here, if I uh, click through to one of the test posts like this, Right now, uh, it just takes me to this page and only the title is being rendered. So let's see how we can grab the content and render that as well. So I'll head over to that front end app and we'll open pages and then uh, this URL catch all route here that's used for rendering individual posts on my site. And we'll scroll down a bit. You can see that I'm using the get static props function um, and I'm passing through the URI of the post uh, that the user is currently on here in the URL. And then I'm firing off um, this get post GraphQL query here to get the title and the content for that post. And then I'm ultimately passing that post data through as props to my single post component, which lives up here. After that post data is received here, um, we're destructuring the title and content and only using one of those at the moment. You can see here, uh, we're rendering an H1 with the title inside. So that's what we see on the page here, but then nothing below it. So the easiest way to do that in a React application like this is to use this syntax. So it's this uh, self-closing div here uh, with dangerously set inner HTML. And then you pass in uh, this object with the post content uh, passed into it. So if I give that a save, there it is. Uh, you can see that now 
we have um, the post content for this particular blog post. There are some, some things that are messed up about this. You can see that like this photo right here is uh, overflowing its container and it's going you know, way off, off to the right. Uh, so there's some styling issues here, but in terms of getting um, the markup on the page, it's all here. Um, so once you do this, your incl inclination might be to dive right into CSS and start styling things like to fix this um, image here. Uh, but you may actually want to consider including a few style sheets that WordPress core has for styling Gutenberg blocks for you. So let's see what that uh, looks like now. Uh, in my front end app, I'll head over to package JSON and I'll just show you what I have installed. So you can see I have this uh, WordPress blocks library, NPM package installed. And what that allows you to do is import a few style sheets like this. So I'll uncomment these at the top of my file. You can see here that I have a common CSS file, style.css and theme.css. So if I import those into you know, the same file where this single post component lives and then save that, as soon as things re-render, now you see that the new styles have been applied. So because I'm using the same exact markup um, that, uh, that the Gutenberg um, editor you know, outputs at the end of the day, and I'm using the same styles that are meant to target uh, that markup, what I end up with is um, styles that you know apply to the markup here on the page. So that's great. Um, so from here, you know you could style this further. Uh, you could layer styles on top of this to do um, to do any you know custom styling uh, for your app. But including those three style sheets does go a long way for just giving you those base styles for all of your blocks. Some things about this are still broken though. And next we'll take a look at one of them, and that is uh, internal links. You can see here it says, if you like this post, you should check out test post two. And there's a link here. And this is an internal link from one blog post over to another blog post. If I hover on this though, you can see down in the corner, it says uh, Gutenberg demo dot local. So it actually points to this blog post on my um, headless WordPress backend, which is not what we want for a Next.js site like this. So if I, uh, were to, if I were to click on this, you can see it sends me over to WordPress. So how can we fix this for our decoupled app so that our internal links between our posts work? Uh, to do that, we can um, employ a filter. And I have a plugin here that you can reference that includes this filter. Um, so I have this repo called replace internal link URLs. And if you want to use this in your project, you can uh, clone it down and you know follow the steps here to get it set up. Uh, but it's really just a single function. So I'll open this PHP file so we can see what's going on here. So really, um, this function just grabs the uh, site URL, which is the WordPress backend, and it grabs the front end app URL. So here I've hard coded this to localhost 3000, but this little to do says, you know, you could swap this out for uh, an environment variable or get the value from the database, wherever you store that value for your project. That's where I would recommend getting it. And once we have both of those, we just run a simple string replace on uh, the post content. So we just replace any instances of you know, the WordPress um, backend for anchor links. We swap that out with the uh, domain for a decoupled WordPress front end. So glancing one more time at this GraphQL query I had fired off earlier, uh, we can see that here's our internal link. If you like this post, you should check out, and there it is, gutenbergdemo.local. So that's what we're gonna try to change now. I'll head over to plugins and I'll activate replace internal link URLs, the plugin that we just saw. All right, after that's activated, we'll head back over to our GraphQL IDE and now we'll fire this off again. All right, so you can see here, it says, um, if you like this post, you should also check out, and then we have localhost 3000 there. Uh, so this fixed our problem. So now in our front end application, I'll reload this page and we should find that these are pointing to the right place. Yeah, so sure enough, you can see down in the corner, it says localhost 3000 followed by uh, the URI for this blog post. So now I'm able to click on this and be sent to the second blog post, which is great. So at this point, we've successfully swapped out the URLs for our internal links so that they all point to the right places. And for some headless WordPress projects, that may be all you need. For others though, where you're using a single page app framework like Next.js that we're using here, uh, that's not quite enough. Um, because as it stands right now, even though the links point to the right places, they're still just plain old anchor tags on the page. 
So that means um, any user who clicks on this link is gonna get a full page reload when they're sent over to the other blog post. So for single page app frameworks like Next.js or Gatsby or Nuxt or others, that's generally not what you want. What you want instead is to use the router that your framework has. Um, and typically these frameworks come with their own link component. So what you wanna do is register one of those link components to the page so that when the user clicks on that, they'll get an immediate cut over to that next route. Thankfully, there is a way to fix this, and that's by using a JavaScript-based HTML parser. So for our project here, uh, the one we'll use is this HTML React parser. This is a React-specific HTML parser that does this. I'll read these two sentences here. Uh, the parser converts an HTML string to one or more React elements. To replace an element with another, check out the replace option. And then further down, they have some documentation for what that looks like. So this is exactly what we need. It allows us to um, take our, our string of HTML that we got from our GraphQL request, feed that into this parser, and it will turn that into uh, React elements and even allow us to swap out some of those with something else, like with a different React component. So this is precisely what we need for our uh, link issue that we talked about. So let's see how we can use this in our project. Um, I'll head from here to the lib folder and then I'll open up parser.js to show you what is being done here. So that library uh, was installed, the HTML React parser, and we're pulling out of that two things, parse and then DOM to React. And then below, we've just created our own function called parse HTML. So it expects a string of HTML here and it passes that into the parse function that this library provides. But not only that, it also provides uh, this options object that's defined above, and we're using the replace option. Here, we're converting internal links to Next.js link components. How this works is as each HTML element is parsed, it gets passed in here to this replace callback function. And in here, we're checking to see if it's an internal link, and we're doing it this way. We're checking to see if the name of it is equal to a, meaning it's an anchor tag, and also if in the attributes for this element, we have a data internal link attribute that is set to true. If you recall, that data attribute was set by this uh, replace internal link URLs plugin that we activated. So if you take a closer look, you can see that in addition to swapping out the WordPress backend URL with our front end URL, we're also tacking on this data attribute. And this is why, it's so that later on, we're able to easily identify uh, which are internal links and swap those out for Next.js link components. Uh, you might see this and think, wait, why are we using a data attribute to recognize which ones are internal links? Couldn't we just look for the ones on the page that, that say localhost 3000? You know, because obviously that would indicate that it's an internal link. Uh, and you could go that route, um, but it's a little trickier than it might seem um, because that URL changes depending on your environment. So if you're on development or staging or production, that's always gonna be a different domain, or even if you're um, on Next.js's server versus on the client, you know, you, you might have a window object uh, in one case, but not in the other case. So it becomes tricky to make sure you always have, um, have you know, the current domain to reference to do that kind of swap. So to make things easy on ourselves, uh, we're just doing it this way. We're tacking on a data attribute, and then when we use our parser here, we can tell it to look for that data attribute. And if that's set to true, then we know this thing that we're, um, that we're dealing with is an internal link. So if that's true, then you can see what we're doing. We're, we're returning a Next.js link component. So now let's make use of this parse HTML function that we've created. I'll head back to my single blog post component and uncomment this line here. So you can see that we're uh, importing parse HTML from uh, that file where we just created our parse HTML function. And then we can use that instead of this dangerously set inner HTML. So what we'll do instead is just have a div here. And then inside of that, we'll call parse HTML and pass into that our post content. After making that change, I can now head over here to my Next.js app and try out an internal link. So I'll click and click again. And as you can see, I'm being sent from one to the other with no full page reload. 
So in this example, we were making use of this parser to swap out regular old anchor tags with link components for our internal links, uh, but you could use this for a number of other things as well. If for your project you wanted to identify a certain um, Gutenberg block and then swap that out with a custom React component, uh, you could do that as well. Finally, let's talk about the trade-off you're making if you choose this approach. I view this approach as the easiest to implement. Uh, rather than having to query for each individual block, we just queried for one field, the post content. Instead of having to write all of the markup from scratch for every single type of block, we just had the markup given to us and we're able to render that to the page. Instead of having to style all of the blocks from the ground up, from scratch, uh, we were instead able to uh, grab several style sheets that WordPress core provides and apply those to get a lot of our base styling uh, done for us. Um, so you can see that all of that adds up. All of those uh, advantages mean less development time uh, that you would need to spend if you go with this approach. As we saw, there are some updates you need to do, like uh, updating the internal links to point to the right places. Um, but other than that, you can largely use the HTML um, as it, it was written. And there's even some flexibility with this approach if you use an HTML parser. So in our example, we're using that to replace some anchor tags with link components. But as I said, you could um, replace some of those HTML nodes with other types of components as well. So due to the ease of implementation that this approach brings to the table, I would seriously consider it if it meets the needs of your project. If you're able to get the post content as HTML and render that to the page, just swapping out maybe a few of those nodes uh, for components and you know calling it a day, if that uh, suits the needs of your project, then that may be the best course of action. That ease of implementation does come at a cost though, and that is less control. So if you want the ability to query for every individual block and every attribute of those blocks and just get JSON data back for those, and then write all of the markup um, from scratch for your components that render those blocks and write all the styles from scratch uh, and have very fine-grained control over exactly you know, what the markup uh, looks like on the page, uh, then this may not be the approach for you. If that sounds like the needs for your project to have that fine-grained control, um, I would stay tuned for uh, the second video in this series where we'll see an alternate approach using the WP GraphQL Gutenberg plugin. So with that, we'll wrap things up. I hope that this video gave you a good sense of what it looks like in practice to render Gutenberg blocks to the page as HTML in a headless WordPress project. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, be sure to subscribe and stay tuned for the second episode in this series.